So yes, we're learning, memorizing, sharing the Lord's Prayer together. Uh, I hope you're doing that. We're going to say it here in a moment. Some of y'all are old enough to remember October 2nd, I think it was 2014 or so, when um, a gunman went into a one-room schoolhouse in the Amish community in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And he took hostages and little girls, 6 to 13 years old. And he shot 10 of them, killing 5. And even now, just to hear that, like, wow. And so tragic. Equally crazy was the response of the Amish community. And it took the world uh, kind of shockingly uh, by storm. Even as it's hard to even think about such an atrocious, heinous event. Some people watched and they said, wow, a hasty forgiveness, uh, that's kind of emotionally unhealthy. Others honored and said, wow, that's, that's just radical stuff. And in dozen interviews after the Amish people, uh, you know, uh, with the Amish people after the tragedy, a watching world came to learn that it is indeed the Amish approach to forgive and to do it quickly and really unconventionally. The father of one of the slain daughters explained, our forgiveness was not our words, it's what we did. And members of the family, the the Amish community, visited the gunman's widow and his family, bringing flowers, going to his home, bringing food, coming around the family members, hugging them. And not saying a whole lot at, at times, but just offering this presence as an act of grace. And of the 75 or so people that were at the killer's funeral, half of them were Amish who were there to offer their presence. They contributed to a fund for the killer's family. Now, for most people, a decision to forgive comes, if ever, after a long, arduous process, months, maybe even years But the Amish invert the process. In their religious tradition, it predisposes them to forgive. Ahead of time, before an injustice is actually done to them. And I'm going to make the case today, as radical as that sounds, it's actually grounded in the teaching and the way of Jesus. And even for some of us, just more Protestant types, We hear that story, and that is so radical, but in fact, it is the way that we're called to live. Loving our enemies, uh, giving up our right for revenge. Forgiveness is an act of faith in the end. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, not yours. So it really is an act of faith in the end. Now, oftentimes we think of forgiveness in such radical terms, and I'm sorry to enter into that that kind of a story, but it just magnifies the grace and forgiveness that has come and, and, and what the story teaches us. We, I've literally sat with families who are seeking to forgive a killer, someone who's murdered a family member. Through the years as a pastor, I've sat with many spouses who have sought to figure out how to forgive, do I forgive, how do you continue a relationship with an unfaithful spouse? I've talked to family members who have gone through, uh, you know, all kinds of things where they've been estranged because a family member had stolen from them or finagled large sums of money out of an inheritance or, or, or somehow manipulated a business deal in their favor and now estranged from family members. I talked to some even this morning trying to figure out how do we continue to have a relationship with the parent, with a mom or a dad, how... how How do we do this? Friends, this this sermon is going to get pretty tender for a lot of us. But we're going to see that forgiveness is actually an everyday occurrence for the follower of Jesus. Remember, the Lord's Prayer, what we're talking about here, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking to kingdom people, not normal people. Kingdom people who live a different life. And, And Matthew 6, 12 is where we land. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
Three questions we're going to ask today, if you want to take notes, and I would encourage you to do so. Some of you might want to read some books that I'll reference and some that are on our resource sermon resource guide, because this is not an easy thing. And so I want us to take this seriously, gang, because some of us have got some hard work to do, or you're going to shrivel up. Your bitterness is going to kill you if you don't apply this message. So three things. First, what is forgiveness? Real simple. I say this, real, real easy outline. Why do we forgive? How do we forgive? We're going to land on some real practical stuff. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. You have the elements under your chairs. And if our students uh, wrap up things upstairs, the, again, the, the place will start shaking and we'll know that the Holy Spirit has shown up among us, okay? Kind of Acts 2 kind of stuff going on. And so um, uh, what, what I want to remind us of, this is within the Sermon on the Mount, okay? So again, it's a Christian manifesto. This is how kingdom people live. And it is radical stuff for Jesus to say, when you pray to the Holy One of Israel, Yahweh, when you pray, call him Abba. And we noted, we're crazy to call God Abba, to call him Father. Crazy stuff. And we talked about how, how nuts this was, scandalous it was that Jesus is teaching this stuff. And so what we need to remember is that, that, that we're talking about people who have a relationship with Jesus, and this is how we live and walk, and, and we don't, we're not normal. And so, you know, a lot of times we talk about how uh, Christianity is not a, not a rela- religion, it's a relationship. And, you know, if you understand that, you resonate with that and go, yeah, yeah, I get that. But do you live that way? Like, is your life really marked by an ongoing pursuit of relationship and intimacy, fellowship with God? Does that mark your life? Like, is the primary thing that you're about? If not, you've gone the way of religion, a religion that bears his name called Christianity, trying to do the stuff, you know, maybe so that others will see you. We've noted that a lot of our Christian lives are, are seen. You come to church and people see me, you know, I'm doing the thing, I'm, I'm serving or something. Your prayer life discloses your dependence on God. That's where Jesus starts into this teaching. We'll get to it in a couple of weeks, which is when you pray, here's how you pray. You don't do it out in front of everybody. You don't go out on the corner and show people how righteous you are, how good you are. Don't do that. That's not what your relationship's about. It starts with prayer. And so with all this in mind, let's say it together, all right? Let's pray it together, all right? You're memorizing it, right? You're learning it, saying it. Let's do it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Here it is. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We'll talk about that latter phrase uh, next week. Here we are today. Forgive us as we also implied, already are forgiving others. So first, what is forgiveness? Let's talk about it. We've sung about it. Uh, We proclaimed it together so good to just behold his love for us. But I want to say, I'm going to start by saying this, uh, exploring our salvation. We got to get this right um, before we move on, uh, as as you'll see, because uh, our salvation has three aspects to it. Again, if you want to take notes here, um, positional, progressive, and ultimate. Positional salvation is to say that we now have a new position before God. He's holy, we're sinners, but with Christ having paid a debt for us, having died on the cross for us, we enter into that. We receive that by faith, not works, and we step into this relationship. We have a new identity. This is synonymous with with when we talk about justification. We've been justified, declared righteous before him. Why? Precisely because a debt has been paid, okay? So in In uh, Colossians 2, it says this, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespass, all our trespasses by canceling the record, here it is, of debt that stood against us with the legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. What are the legal demands? He's saying the, the law, the holy law of God, which is only what this, his original hearers knew. Religion, law. They didn't know anything about grace. Jesus is preaching a new message when he comes, a message of grace. He says the law that is crushing every one of us 
because it's holy, perfect, and none of us can live this way. Jesus took this upon himself. He lived the perfect life, right? Becomes the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, perfect lamb of God, taking away all our sins. The great exchange, our sin for his righteousness because the debt has been canceled. Somebody say amen. All right, thank you. We're singing it earlier, but yes. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, it says this. If we say we have no sin, you're lying to yourself, deceiving yourself, and the truth is not with us. It's not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what about you? Have you received Christ? And if you haven't, friends, do not leave this place. Even now, receive by grace. By faith, his grace that's come to you. Or you're still under the judgment of God. And and we don't want you to leave today without receiving Christ. We have a new position. There's this progressive nature of salvation. That is to say, it involves a process of becoming who we already are. Okay, not to attain salvation. Progressive salvation is what we call sanctification. If the other is justification, this is sanctification. Becoming holy, becoming like Jesus. This is where a lot of us are right now. Becoming like Christ as we're set apart in this world of God's purposes. And we're going to praise the Lord that our students are up there. Sounds like they're starting to worship right now. <laughs> praise him. Yeah, there's a bunch of kids up there. And we had such a blast yesterday. So um, don't let that distract you, but just say, Lord, thank you so much. Um, and then ultimate salvation. Ultimate salvation is glorification, okay? When we're totally removed from sin and and we're now perfected in our holiness, we become like Jesus, you know, completely, totally forgiven in his presence. So all three aspects of our salvation, hang with me, are, are, are done by God. They're acts of God that are completed by him. And so that's what forgiveness is. It's the canceling of all debts. And if you are, if you've received his grace, friend, that's who you are. Your idea, you are forgiven. So as you see in this prayer, forgive. Why? Because you've been forgiven. That's why. That's a big part of it. And this is going to come down on me just in a minute. All right. Maybe not. All right. So why do we forgive? Why forgive? We forgive because we have been forgiven. And we're not normal people, right? I mean, we forgive because we have. I can say it this way. To be forgiven is to live as a preemptive forgiver. Preemptive forgiveness. This is what the Amish are teaching us here, right? And too often we, we forget that we're to give what we've already been given. Too often we forget, I've been blessed to be a blessing. And as has, has been noted, uh, just a little sidetrack here, we were able to do so this week. And I want to tell you, friends, we are, if you're a guest, we're a church that just seeks to bless our city. And so through relationships that we have at Vickery, I mean, I mean like friends. I'm not saying we're like we drop in, swoop in and out. We have ongoing relationship with friends at Jacklow Elementary, especially where we're blessing children. And because of relationships like, uh, gosh, who lead the way? Jessica Lambert and Terry Hurd. Some of y'all know these people. Blanca Lerma. Many of you in the room um, who, who, who know these people, who love them like, like I do, we're there with them. And we, we realize y'all have got some needs. This could go down. And, th- and sure enough, it came. We were able to give bottled water and, and blankets. And through the Bob Herrera Ministry Center, which we established, we were able to give blankets and food to people who were in need this week. And I'll tell you, a really cool part of this story is this. Listen to this. A cool part of the story is that, that many of the blankets that we gave away came from Cornerstone Church, partners in South Dallas. How cool is this? South Dallas blessing North Dallas so that we could come together, serve our friends from all over the world at Vickery. How legit is that? Yes, praise the Lord. And gang, listen, you have opportunity to be a part of that. You can say, that's cool. Um, We did that. And yes, we did do that. You did that. Many of you brought stuff, right? When you see the call, I had a pastor friend of mine in our city who goes, I'm I'm so amazed at your church, how every time there seems to be a need, y'all quick to move. And that's who we want to be. That's who we are. Why? Because Jesus has forgiven us, right? Wicked, 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 wicked. Let's go. (laughs) Matthew 6. Watch this. Matthew 6. I'm going to go DJ on y'all. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says this. He says that after, after he preaches, I mean, teaches this little portion on how to, how to pray, he then offers commentary on this phrase that we're looking at today. And the commentary is right after 
this passage. And it goes like this. Look, here you can see it. And you can open your Bible. Matthew 6 is where we are. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you also. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, that sounds pretty clear, doesn't it? If you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. If you forgive, then he'll forgive you. Now, let me offer a little word here about uh, scriptural kind of interpretation. Okay, exegesis. How to unpack a passage. One of the principles that we follow is scripture interprets scripture. We've already noted salvation is not based on anything you do. Even something as noble as forgiving someone. You don't do something and then God says, okay, got to act now. No, grace is one way love. We, we, but we want this law of reciprocity, don't we? Because it's about power and control. If I can do something, then I bring something to the table. So now he's got to. And some Christians live this way. I've, I've sought to be good. I go to church and my life is jacked up. I love that person and they did me wrong. And, and, and so we really get messed up. And we start to not believe in the scriptures or, or believe in, in, in God because it's not a law of reciprocity. That's not the Christian faith. And so what is he saying here? If he's not saying that, then what is he saying? Okay, another aspect of interpretation is to understand the context within which a passage falls. Okay, that's why we need, frankly, those who, of us who understand historical context, understand scripture, to teach and to guide us oftentimes. You can do this in your own studies as well. But my point is this. We've got to put it in the, in the context of Sermon on the Mount. So think about this. The Sermon on the Mount is being preached, and now we're right in the middle of it. So he's been going chapter 5 on through, on through 6, 7, and he's teaching a people who know nothing about grace, religion only, okay? So religion, religious people are hearing him. First hearers are going, hmm, what is this about? And here's what Jesus says. You can look at the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, and, and what he says here is, is that that he's taking this whole thing to the, to the furthest degree. And what I mean is, he's wanting to show you, here's where the law goes. He, he says, I came not to abolish the law, but to what? Fulfill it. Meaning, in the person of Jesus, he completely fulfills the, the perfect law of God in his own life. From his heart and everything he does. And so what he's saying here to these people, he wants them to see. It's early on in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. In, in fact, he says in chapter 5, verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And he's implying, scribes and Pharisees, you're out as well. Jesus is not making friends. What he's doing here is saying, the holy law of God still stands and will always stand. And so he says this. You know, it goes on in the Sermon on the Mount. He says things like, you heard it said, but I say... Right? The religion says, but I say this. The law crushes you, but I say this. In fact, he goes on to say, let me, let me be clear about this. Hatred is murder. What? Lust is adultery. And if, if you sin, if, you're, if your right eye calls you to sin, pluck it out. Take it out. It's better for you to, to just pull your eye out instead of going to hell. If someone slaps you in the face, turn, turn the other cheek, give them the other cheek. If someone wants your, in essence, if they want your sweater, give them your sweater and your coat. Give them, love your enemies. And we're going, well, really? Is that, I mean, is, do we trust him with that? He's trying to bury every person under the weight of God's holy demands. This is not simply to cause us to blush, but to give up. I mean, just fall out before him. The point is, Jesus is, is, is wanting every one of us in, in his first tears. Nobody can do this. I mean, even his disciples said that at a point, right? Who then can be saved if not this guy? He, he's done it all, the rich young ruler. Do you see your need for him today? I think it's probably why you're here. But he's also saying, here it is. He's saying, to the degree that I'm able to forgive others um, it's, it's, there's a correlation between how I have received his grace for me. That's why I always, we, we sang it earlier. Stop trying to be like him and just behold him. See his love for you. That's what promises to obedience, right? And so he's trying to show us here, you can't do this, but he is saying 
that you're going to forgive to the degree that you really understand and embrace the grace of God. That's why our central message here is always grace, grace. Let's just preach the heck out of grace. Because that's where we gain traction and obedience. Jesus is saying, you forgive. He's saying this, basically. If you forgive, you're forgiven. If you don't forgive, you're not. You don't get it. Because this is a fruit. It's a byproduct of what's happened in your life. Okay, so why do we forgive? Because that's who we are. And then finally, and we'll close with this. Get real practical because some of y'all, we really need to apply this. How do we forgive? In short, how? Just like Jesus. Because again, that's who our king is. That we're trying to live like him. And so in Ephesians 4, 32, it says, be kind to one another. Listen to these words, tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as, here's, here's the language, just as God in Christ forgave you. Already happened. So we're little Christ. How do we forgive? Just like him. And then in Colossians 3, 12, 13, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, kingdom people, holy and beloved, that's who you are, compassionate hearts. Listen to this, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also are to forgive one another. In an age when Christians have got to be right, Right? And many of our representatives we see on television or whatever else, we get this Christian, and he's just not even following the way of Jesus. He might believe certain doctrine and say he's a believer, but in an age where people, Christians, got to be right, got to be at the center, got to be in power, what if we took on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and enemy love? What could go wrong? This is our witness. This is what you bring to the office. This is what you bring into your family. I'd say it this way. To be forgiven is to forgive. That's it. And we only forgive as much as we've been forgiven. There's a correlation. So let's keep unpacking this. We don't, we don't mess up a relationship we already have. This is about a fellowship with God. We follow our perfect forgiver, Jesus. N.T. Wright the one who said, To refuse to to forgive is to cut off the branch you're sitting on. And he's called us to forgive. When you think of forgiveness as a daily need you have, then you start to see how powerful it is as you give it to others. We we think that we're holding back forgiveness and they're going to make the first move. But what we're really doing, man, we are, I mean, we're, we're developing this bitterness and this ungrace in our own lives. Philip Yancey, in one of my top five books of all time, probably, What's so amazing about grace? You can find all these resources on our uh, resource guide, sermon resource guide online with this sermon. Reminds us that forgiveness, like grace, has this maddening quality of being undeserved. But we try to withhold it, and it contaminates our own hearts. Anne Lamott's the one who said, to not forgive is like drinking rat poison and waiting on the rat to die. While it's eating us alive. Yancey writes this. Ungrace does its work quietly and lethally. Like a poisonous undetectable gas. A father dies unforgiven. A mother who once carried a child in her own body. Does not speak to that child for half its life. The toxin steals on. From generation to generation. And again I've already already talked to several this morning. After the first sermon. First service, how do, how do I do this? How do I forgive my mom? How do I get, I don't even want to be around my dad. I can't. My stepfather is, I can't, can't do it. Forgiveness, friends, is monumental. We've got to figure this out. Yancey recalls the words of Helmut Tielek. He's a Jew who survived the horrors of Nazism. And he tried to wrestle with how to forgive. And he says this, this business of forgiving is by no means a simple thing. We say, very well, if the other fellow is sorry and begs my pardon, I'll forgive him. Then I'll give in. We make of forgiveness a law of reciprocity. And this never works, he says. For then both of us say to ourselves, the other fellow has to make the first move. And then I watch him like a hawk. 
to see whether the person will flash a signal to me with his eyes or whether I can detect some small hint between the lines of his letter, which shows that he is sorry. I am always, he says this, on the point of forgiveness, but I never forgive. I am too just. And the Bible says that mercy triumphs over justice in Jesus. Grace triumphs over justice. In a book that I read some years ago by Lewis Smead, this is a great book, by the way, called The Art of Forgiving. He helped me, he's helped me along the way a lot and helped me to counsel others to understand what forgiveness is not, okay? And I, I hope you guys are gonna apply this. Uh, I, I, hope, I see some of you taking notes. Some of you ought to read these books. This is serious stuff. I mean, even the question of who we need to forgive is an interesting question. So let's unpack it before we land. Because uh, if somebody's just unkind to you, maybe you just need to get over it, right? Like some days, I mean, it's like, that person's a jerk. I need to write a blog about that. I need to po- that person just hurt my feelings. I'm going to post that. Really? No, get over yourself is what you need to do and, and press on. You, maybe you don't need to forgive them. You need to simply love them. So, so how do you know, right? Some say you can only forgive someone who has directly done something to you personally. Now, wait, what if they've hurt someone I love? Some would say, no, no, they didn't do anything to you. Maybe it's a sense of, maybe you do need to forgive them. Maybe it's a family member and there's some sense of forgiveness, yes. But, but, but often, most often, it's someone who's done something directly to you. And you can't forgive someone for well, who they are. Like, again, you're just a jerk, but I don't need to forgive you. I'm just gonna develop some boundaries here. I don't wanna go to lunch with you again. I'm not doing that. Or, or, or people, people who sniper fire, you know, and, you know, at me often on social media, whatever else, I'll extend some gracious response and then they come at me again, bam, you're out, I'm sorry, I don't, and you're like, Jeff, where's the grace? Now nah, you're blocked, I'm done. I'm not, not gonna do it. Because, because sometimes, and I'll forgive you, I'll bless you. I want, and I don't, I rarely do that. I'm like, this person's a jerk. They need to keep hearing what I'm saying, frankly. I mean, they really do. Um, We forgive people for what they've done to us, not who they are, okay? But I'm saying sometimes you just have to develop some boundaries. And you have, and you forgive individuals. You don't forgive entities. You can't forgive, you know, like that college did me wrong, you know? No. Or, Or even nowadays, that church did me wrong. Church, people, individuals person, a member, a pastor, you you know, to focus in. And even there, when there's like, maybe there's group decisions that are made or something, you know, who, who really needs your forgiveness, you know, be clear about that or you're mad at the wrong person and your forgiveness really doesn't, doesn't do a whole lot. See, get to the source or you may be angry and bitter for days and decades. So what's the end result? What's the end game of forgiveness? Forgiveness is not agreeing or condoning what the person has done. This is always kind of the case. Like if I just like forgive them and love them, they're going to think I, no, they are. They probably know where you stand. And if they don't be explicit, then when they enter back into your life, they, you, they already know where you stand, but I'm going to love you. And then they're going, dang, they, they don't like what I'm doing, but they're loving me right now. Love wins. Grace wins the day. Forgiveness does not mean that you necessarily allow that person back into your life or in that space where they were in. Uh, it doesn't mean that you release the person from, uh, from accountability. Like I've, I've literally talked to, to spouses, gosh, many times through the years who have sought to say, I don't know how to forgive and move on with my unfaithful spouse. Or if you're in an abusive relationship, I counsel people, don't, don't go back in there. Do not go back to that. Unless they've proven over time with therapy, some kind of rehabilitation, they're accountable. But even then, be slow to move back. You're not releasing them from being accountable. I mean, I've literally sat behind that glass you know, window at a prison. I've done this several times. In prison talking to someone. Because here's the thing. I want to, let's, let's take steps. Let's do this. Consider steps towards forgiveness. First, rediscover their humanity. The person who's hurt you. And what I mean is, the person murders someone. Murderer. Right? Or 
They've been unfaithful. Adulterer. Liar. We make them out to be what they've done when they're much more than that. They're so much more than that. Because we're all, what I've, and where I was heading was, I mean, I've, I've sat there and I've left, I've talked to someone who's murdered someone, literally. And I've talked to, to prisoners and, and I leave going, he's, he's just like me. He's just like me. And if you've ever worshiped in prison, I doubt many of you have. I have actually worshiped, not because I was in prison, but I was in prison for a season, for a while. But I was in prison um, with, uh, I've been many times, prison ministry. And you talk about some people worshiping God. They've been set free. It's like going to the men of Nehemiah. It's like, you know, ministries that we have. Why? Because they know they're guilty. A debt has been paid and they're now worshiping God with all they've got. I leave those moments going, man, that's, I, I got nothing on them. I mean, see, here's what happens. An unforgiveness, unforgiveness in our hearts is often an expression of pride. Like you're better than them. Well, yeah, I haven't murdered anybody. Yeah, but again, I say it often. If you're not the most sinful person you know, you don't know yourself very well. So we, we forgive because we've been forgiven, but rediscover the humanity of the person. Secondly, surrender your right to get even. This is how you start to know you're forgiving. See, we, 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 wanna, we want vengeance. We can't forgive because we want them to pay the price. We, we want to see a little pain. As kingdom people, we're not brought into the world to bring pain. We're brought to bring love, compassion, and grace. Not pain. And, and then, then thirdly, revise your feelings and hopes for them. This, and what I mean is, you know, your hopes for the person who's done you wrong ultimately is, I may not have you in my life, or I don't, you know, we're not going to be best friends, but I'm going to pray now for you to flourish and for God to bless your life. That's when you know you've moved to grace. You can begin to pray good things will happen for them. Friends, we, give, we forgive because that's who we are. And, and, and only in Christianity do you have an ethical system that says, I now do these things because that's who I am. No other religious system has this. We forgive, why? Because I have a new identity now. I'm brand new. I'm a new person. Every religious ethical system would say, don't murder. Don't, you know, don't kill somebody. Don't lie. That's not, that's not specifically Christian. But what is, is we live out of this thing that we've now become. It's preemptive grace, preemptive forgiveness. And only in Christianity do you have a God who prays. No religion would ever dare say something like this. He's in the garden praying, not my will, but yours be done. So that we could pray, not my will, but yours be done. And then on the cross, Jesus is praying, asking for the Father to forgive those who were killing him. And among the people, you and me, be certain, friends, as he died on the cross and as we remember his sacrifice for us today, of all the faces that he saw going through his divine mind in the moment, he saw mine. And he saw yours. And he stayed and he did it all for love so that we could live forgiven and forgive. And so I want to, let's just bow our heads right now. We're going to enter into a time of confession and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together and we're going to sing our way out. We're going to sing our way out. So right where you are, who, who is it that you need to forgive? Is there someone? Maybe for a lot of us, I think maybe you say, well, I, th- I don't think I've forgiven. I have forgiven them. But do you need to go deeper? Do you need to reach out? Do you need to love them in some way? What are you going to do? Let the Spirit speak. Just outlove them, outgrace them. Maybe there's someone in your life you just don't like a whole lot. Maybe it's someone at work. Maybe it's someone who has rubbed you wrong. Determined to love them. Confess your sin before God. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's withholding love. 
a sin of omission, maybe even lazy spiritually, not serving others. Confess that now. Bring your sin to him right now. Just confess it. And friends, have, let's have a courageous love. It says, I will do this by the power of the Spirit. And now in the same attitude of prayer, I want you to take your, um, the elements. You have them under your seat right now. And we're going to partake of these simple little symbols that represent something so powerful. A debt that was paid for us. So turn it over to the where you have the bread on the top. You have to peel that little little thing off there. And this little little bread represents the body of Christ, real flesh and blood, broken for us, paying the price for our sin. He would say in the in the upper room that first Lord's Supper. He would say, "Let the sustenance of grace, my life." be the thing that drives you. My will be done through every, every bone of your body, everything you say, everything you think, everything you do. But don't ever forget what the price paid for you. Take, eat, and remember. Thank you, Lord. And then uh, turn it around the top with this, uh, the juice here representing the blood of Christ. Real blood shed for us, the perfect lamb of God to take away the sin of the world and those of us who know him and received it by faith. He said, remember the debt that's been paid. You're forgiven. You can forgive. Never forget. Take and drink. Lord, we praise you for the debt paid. But this stuff of forgiveness is so hard. It's an unnatural move because it's supernatural. So we need you. We need you. And we need you this week. We need you this afternoon. We need your power to do so, to live this life you called us to, that we might experience joy. We thank you that once forgiven, that forgiveness really is possible even joyful as we outgrace people and love them like you loved us. So we proclaim it together. We need you, God. In your name we pray. Amen.